Assembly lines in GregTech are one of the most interesting automation puzzles in all of modded Minecraft. Assembly line mechanics are incredibly straightforward, but you will have to use your knowledge of complex automation tools in order to integrate them properly into your factory. In this tutorial, you will learn about assembly line mechanics, subnetting, P2P interfaces, and the advanced blocking card, a mysterious and powerful item that can be found in no other mod packs. If you're looking for the assembly line tutorial, wait like 15 seconds. At the end of the video, I will explain the advanced blocking card, which is the most important and mysterious part of this system. For that, skip to the timestamp here. So you've reached the end of IV and you've built your first assembly line. First off, congratulations on making it this far. This machine is one of my favorite multi-blocks, and its automation challenge is simple yet engaging. An assembly line is a modular GregTech multi-block that can be between 2 and 16 blocks long, with input buses along the entire bottom middle of the structure. Additionally, an output bus is placed on the last slice on either side of the input bus. Up to 4 input hatches for fluids are placed on the bottom to either side, starting from the first slice. For most recipes, an assembly line that is 11 blocks long with 4 input hatches is more than enough. Two conditions that are unique to the assembly line must be satisfied in order to start an assembly line craft. Firstly, items must be placed in order starting from the first slice under the controller to the last, where the item is output. The second condition is that assembly lines also require data to craft, which you can get by scanning items into a data stick using a scanner block. You can place these data sticks into a data hatch on the assembly line, or later on, you can connect your assembly lines to a data bank to distribute data between them. You can check in the scanner tab in NEI to figure out which item you need to scan to get the corresponding data. For example, in order to craft your first LUV motor, Scan an IV motor to get the data and place the data stick in your assembly line. After both conditions are met, your assembly line will begin the craft. So, how do you make sure that these conditions are met consistently and automatically? Furthermore, how can you integrate assembly lines into your AE2 network? The answer, as always, is subnetting. Yippee! You are now going to turn the buses on your assembly line into a subnet, where each bus is an inventory for recipe items to be stored. Begin by placing storage buses on each of the ULV input buses beneath the assembly line. To ensure that recipe ingredients are placed in order, we configure the priority of these buses, starting from priority 0 on slice 1 and subtracting one level of priority for each further slice. Place fluid storage buses on your fluid input hatches, using the same method of decreasing priority as you go. Connect all of the storage buses as such, using alternating cable colors to distribute channels evenly, all connecting to one dense cable spine. As you may know, subnets with more than 8 components require an ME controller, which you can place here. Collect the output of your assembly line craft via output bus, depositing recipe outputs into your main network. When wiring, make sure not to mix these mainnet cables with your assembly line subnet. I also like to place an optional ME terminal here to check on items and pull them out if the assembly line is stuck. Additionally, you will need a way to send and receive recipes. This is done by placing two kissing dual interfaces. One will be connected to mainnet, which will send AE2 patterns into the assembly line subnet, and the other can be attached to your assembly line subnet, which will receive and distribute those items to the buses. Set the main network dual interface to blocking mode. In the interface on the subnet side, place an advanced blocking card. Now, if you're wondering what advanced blocking cards do, hold on to that thought as I'm going to loop back to that in the end of this video. When you wire this up, you will want to do one final thing, which is to place a quartz fiber in between the main network and subnetwork. This fiber transfers power, which your subnet needs to move and store items, but does not transfer channels or any other data. 
In order to make working patterns for the assembly line, you will need to craft the Fluid Pattern Processing Terminal, which gives you input slots you need to program assembly line crafts. You will need to handcraft the first couple of LUV parts in order to make this. Once you have acquired the Fluid Pattern Processing Terminal, pattern everything as usual, making sure to never multiply the recipe, as normal assembly lines can only take one recipe at a time due to their unique mechanics. As you start patterning more and more assembly line crafts, you might notice a couple of crafts will cause your assembly line to stall, leaving items in the buses. Any craft where multiple slices contain less than a stack of the same item will not end up crafting, as all of the items will try to stack into one bus. You can get around this most easily using nameplates in a forming press. This takes three forming press buses, each with a different nameplate. For example, I have AL1, AL2, and AL3. When items are renamed, they lose the ability to stack, but can still be used to complete a craft. You will need to automatically rename these items, which means that we need to make more patterns. Let's start with the Tier 4 ingots as an example, which will require two unstacking compressed ice plates. Craft two compressed ice plates and place one of them in the AL1 bus. Grab the item and make a pattern that sends regular ice plates to automatically be renamed. In your main pattern, replace the second compressed ice plate with the renamed AL1 version of the plate. After this, your craft should progress smoothly. Some crafts have up to four of the same item in different slots, so keep an eye out for crafts like this and repeat the renaming process for each one. When you eventually make more of them, assembly lines are also one of the first real use cases for P2P dual interfaces. Peer-to-peer -peer interfaces distribute patterns from one parent interface to multiple output interfaces. This can allow you to parallelize one recipe between multiple assembly lines. You can set this up by adding a parent peer-to-peer -peer interface anywhere in your base, then crouching and right-clicking it with a network card in order to copy its frequency. Then, right-click to bind your output P2P dual interfaces. Set each output interface to blocking mode and provide the parent dual interface with all of your patterns. Keep in mind that each assembly line will still need data, which you can duplicate by using the target data stick in the bottom right slot of a scanner, but data banks are definitely a better option in the long run. With all that done, you should have a pretty good handle on this iconic machine, which also happens to be one of my favorites. If you have any further questions, please drop by my Discord, and if you want to find out what the advanced blocking card does, stay locked in. So you know that the advanced blocking card is vital to our assembly line automation, but what exactly is the advanced blocking card actually doing? Why isn't regular blocking mode enough? What makes this coveted card so special? The advanced blocking card was created by GTNH dev FireNew in 2023 with the purpose of adding blocking functionality to ME interfaces. When an interface with blocking mode is asked to send a pattern into an adjacent inventory, it will first check whether the adjacent inventory contains items. If it does, blocking mode will stop the next craft from being sent to the inventory. The inventory of a subnet consists of a network of items, and although you can insert and extract items from any interface connected to your subnet, interfaces do not strictly contain those items. This means that blocking mode will not work as it is. Enter the advanced blocking card. An advanced blocking card reads a subnet's contents and displays that information to adjacent interfaces. This way, blocking mode on them works, as the interface sending patterns can now detect when to stop delivering recipes. This feature is incredibly useful for a wide array of advanced AE2 automations, including things like universal automation, assembly lines, infusion alters, and even all the way up to Eye of Harmony automation. The advanced blocking card's ability to request a precise amount of items into a complex automation system is highly coveted, and I hope after watching this video you can understand why. You watched this whole video, and as such, for some reason, you feel compelled to subscribe, join my Discord, and follow me on Twitch. I don't make the rules. If you are interested in other in-depth tutorials on complicated automations, 
make sure to check out my Universal Automation and Meteor Automation tutorials. As always, be kind to yourself and be kind to others, and peace.